I hadn't heard that one in a while. Well, good. If you have your Bible, turn with me tonight to 1 Timothy, chapter number 1. First Timothy chapter number one, verse seven. First Timothy one seven. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. We know the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And if there be anything, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Yes. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Yes. And now he rejoices. Yes. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, yes. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray that you'd anoint your holy word as it goes forth and anoint this messenger tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I get a lot of emails that uh, some of them come in absolute desperation. It is... Uh, if you've never been in a situation where the weight of your sin is bearing down so much on your soul that you don't even want to live, you really can't understand how some of these people feel. But I'm going to read a couple of them for you tonight. He said, I was watching videos of you on YouTube about hell. I've been very disrespectful towards God. I made fun of him dying on the cross. I ask him for forgiveness, and right now, I don't know if I'm going to hell or heaven. I wish that I was not born. I don't even deserve forgiveness for what I have done. Is there any way you can help me? That just came in a couple of days ago. And here's another one. Could I humbly ask you to pray for me? I do not feel saved. I believe in God. I believe in the Lord Jesus, his God manifest in the flesh, born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life and died for my sins. I've read the articles on your website. Still, I do not know if God wants me. It has always been like this, even from a child. Another one says, To my understanding, my sister came to me in 2012 and said that I should change my ways and live a life in Christ. I denied Christ's calling through her, and it's quite depressing knowing that I will be going to hell, and there is nothing I can do because I missed my chance. And in practically every situation, there's always an issue that comes up between that individual and God. Preacher, many years ago, I tried to commit suicide. I swallowed a whole bottle of Tylenol. I didn't go to the doctor for 24 hours. I was in ICU for three days. The doctor said by all rights I should have been dead because my liver count was elevated so high 
I'd waited so long before coming for help. I was vomiting up blood, had severe stomach cramps, the whites of my eyes were yellow, and my skin was yellow. But for some reason, God saved me. He pulled me through and healed me. Why? I don't know, preacher. I really don't know. I'm so unworthy of his love and his miracles. Then they continue on. Then I'm, then, and then I'm positive he sent me the dream I emailed you about last week. I'm sure it was from him. He was waking me up, preacher. He was letting me know the end is near and I needed to repent. I needed to come back to him. Now I cannot get enough of his word. I study scripture and listen to your sermons daily. All I think about is Christ. I wake up in the morning thinking about Christ. I think about Christ all day. I go to bed thinking about Christ. I woke up during the night thinking about Christ. I want to live for Christ and glorify Christ in all my ways. I think before I do anything and question myself, what would Christ think about this? My life has changed drastically. And of course I know it has because all she talks about the Lord. I don't have to follow her around. <laughs> I know her life has changed drastically. Someone else said that. He said, for to me to live is what? Christ. Christ. And to die is gain. And then he says, this is from a man, I'm 44 years old and I feel absolutely dead inside. I'm afraid to die and I'm certain I will go to hell. I have committed almost every sing single sin you can name. I have a rage inside of me that I detest. Looking in the mirror makes me angry at myself. I would give my last breath for salvation, and yet I am lost. Now, this is what I'm getting. I get this on a constant basis, constant, constantly, all the time. So now tonight, what would you say to these folks? What would you say to them if they say, I've committed a sin that God won't forgive me for? Satan has driven me so far from God that he won't hear me? God doesn't want anything to do with me. And uh, I made fun of God. I made fun of the cross, the crucifixion. I joked about it, you know, and cursed him. Would God save a wretch like me? This is why I read to you from 1 Timothy chapter number 1. This man is a murderer. The apostle Paul, if you know anything about his life, you know he's a murderer. He's a murderer. He had letters to Damascus that he received from the synagogue, that if he ever found any of that way, that was before they were called Christians. Yeah. During this period of time, they were, they were referred to the people of the way. Amen. And if he found any of that way, he, bought, he brought them bound back to Jerusalem to be stoned to death. They threw their coats at his feet when Stephen was stoned to death. This man is a murderer. And he wants you to know that he was of all sinners the chief on the face of the earth. Chief, chief of sinners. This is not just some empty rhetoric he's giving you. He's telling you what he feels. There's a lot of preachers I've listened to for years and I've never heard them one time refer to the fact that they were so sorry and low down when God saved them. It's almost like he just made them better. God reached down the pit when he got me. Maybe that's why we can minister to some people because they can identify with the fact that we were sinners. Here's a man right here that's a sinner, folks. And here's what he said about his life. He said, I was a pattern for them that should hereafter believe. Look at verse 17. This is very important. Verse 16. He said, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. That Greek word there literally means... I am the prototype. You know what a prototype is, don't you? See? It's the first one of its kind, and then they build the rest of them after the prototype. Paul said, I am a prototype of all that should believe hereafter. Now think about this. We don't run you back to the book of Leviticus. We don't run you back to the Old Testament law. We don't run you back to places in the Old Testament scripture and try to confuse you as to how you're saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us 
the word or the ministry of reconciliation. Yes, he's angry in the Old Testament. God's anger and his wrath reaches forth, very angry. But he settled it at Calvary, and he extended an olive branch, and the anger is gone. God has reconciled himself to man. That's important to understand. Because if, you, if, you, if, if you're going to let the devil lie to you tonight about whether God will ever forgive you for what you've done, then you're going to have to reject what God said himself. And what he said is plain. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Then he said, to cap it off, he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin then he caps that off by saying that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That tells you that there is a vast difference between the righteousness of an Old Testament saint and the righteousness of a New Testament born-again believer. The righteousness of a New Testament born-again believer is the righteousness of a sinless, perfect man who offered himself on the cross at Calvary and was received by God the Father. And when he ascended into the presence of the Father, he ascended into the presence of the Father by his own righteousness. <laughs> I don't know if that ever sinks in or not. Let it sink in. He did not bring that righteousness down from heaven. And the God-man did not come down from heaven. The second person of the Godhead came down from heaven and was incarnate as the God-man in the womb of the virgin. And from the moment that he drew his first, first breath on this earth until he completely gave himself unto the Father at the cross, he built a righteousness that, my friend, was completely and absolutely dependent upon God the Father in absolute and complete obedience. And the Father received him into his presence Therefore, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Amen. So the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to the heavens by his own righteousness. Watch this. Turn to Romans chapter 10. And hold your place here in 1 Timothy. Romans chapter 10. Verse 4. Well, let's just go back to the first verse. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, they may be saved. I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now watch this. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now look at this. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. In plainer words, all of the righteous demands of the law were met in the perfect sinless life of Christ. And if you're born again, that righteousness becomes your righteousness because the Bible said in 1 Corinthians, he's made into us righteousness. Now look at verse five. Now watch this, this is important. Moses describeth the righteousness which is the law that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Now watch this carefully. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Hold it for a moment now. What's this mean? What is he talking about? Who shall ascend into heaven? Enoch was taken and did not see death. Elijah was carried up in a chariot of fire. But in neither case, in either case, neither one of them, were they, was anything said about their righteousness qualifying them to go into the presence of God. But here you have one who rises from the dead, and because of his sinless, perfect life, his righteousness qualifies him. And how do we know that? Because he questions the Old Testament question that said, Who shall ascend? It's talking about who can go up to the top of the Mount of God in Jerusalem? Who can ascend to the holy hill of Zion? Who dares come into the presence of Almighty God? Who can do it? Nobody could. 
Nobody could ascend to the top of that mountain and walk in and approach God on their own merit. They had to first offer a sacrifice to the brazen altar. They had to carry that and then take that blood and, and sanctify that altar. Then they had to carry that blood inside and inside of the, all, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the at the golden altar. There that blood could be taken on inside and it would be sprinkled upon the mercy seat, that blood. And that's the only way that he could enter in. The high priest had to enter in with the blood of something else other than his own blood. And it was a vicarious death. And it was only for a temporal time to push away another year the sins of the people. He couldn't go in on his own blood. He had to go into the blood of bulls and goats. But the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Hebrews entered one time with his own blood. With his own blood, he entered into the presence of God. His blood represented his life, which represented his righteousness. And God the Father accepted him and said, sit down, son. Now there is a righteousness in heaven that was not there before. And the righteousness in heaven that was not there before is the righteousness of the finished work, the completed perfection of sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. That righteousness is at the right hand of the Father. Now a guilty sinner comes to God. He's broken every law that God ever made. He's filthy. He's as filthy as he can be. He's like that priest over there in the book of Zechariah. Filthy. Garments are filthy. Standing before the Lord. How can you cleanse him? What can you do for someone like that? Well, you say, preacher, religion tells him to straighten up his act and live right. Sure, you go ahead and try to live right. But what you're trying to do is to offer your righteousness into the sight of God to get you to, be, to qualify you to go into his presence, and it won't work. There is none righteous, no, not one. So what do you do? You go to Romans 10. And here's what it says. Romans 10. Don't say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to do what? Bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up again from the dead. He descended and he arose from the dead because death couldn't hold him. Verse 8. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the head man believeth unto righteousness. Messed up, didn't I? Glad you caught me. What does it say? Heart. Salvation is of the heart, not the head. See, one of these souls here said, I believe in the resurrection of Christ. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe, I believe all these things. But has no peace. Why do they have no peace? Because the heart has not reached out and embraced him. What does that mean, preacher? That means this Greek word pistuo is not some flippant thing where you just say, Yes, I believe in this, and you confirm them. You believe the catechism, and you believe all. Yes, I believe every bit of the catechism. Then we confirm you. Now you're a Christian. Oh, you've prayed the sinner's prayer. We wave our hand over your head. Now you're a Christian. You've done this. You've done not nothing. It has nothing to do with what you do. It has everything to do with what you're doing in your heart. The heart. What does that mean? How does it mean to believe in the heart? It means to take everything that you think you are or could be and reject everything else and reach out with all you have within you and take hold of the Lord Jesus Christ and say the Lord Jesus, say Lord Jesus, Savior, you're going to be my Savior. I receive you as my Savior. I cling to you. There's nowhere else to go. You're my Lord, my God, and my Savior. And only a person can do that. I can't do it for you. I can pray with you. I can get you to repeat some sinner's prayer. I can take you through the Roman road and all that. That's not going to save you. You've got to do it yourself. But here's the key. And the key is that Satan will fight you at every place, every place, everywhere, that you make an attempt to approach God. He's going to fight you. Why? Because he accuses you. Let's say you've tried to clean up your act. And Satan will say to you, when you try to pray to God, you're not clean enough yet. You need to clean up some more. And Satan will put you in an endless odyssey toward cleaning up your life. 
And a lot of people out there have cleaned up their life. They are good moral people. And they feel good about the victories that they've won and the morality that they've established and how well they're respected in the community and all of that. But they're not saved. Because all of their hope is what they've done and how they're received of men. But the Apostle Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. So when he came to the Lord, he didn't come to the Lord based on what he'd done. He knew he was sorry. He came to the Lord based on what the Lord had done. Now think about this for a minute. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. I'm going to tell you something tonight. I've been studying this Bible a long time. I've done a lot of, a lot of praying over a lot of things. I feel real bad about a lot of people that go to church every Sunday. I really do. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't feel good about it. I don't feel good about it. I think they've got religion. Amen. They've got religion, but they don't have salvation. You see, this girl says, I think of Christ when I get up. I think about him all day long. I wake up during the night thinking about him. I want to live for Christ and glorify Christ in all my ways. In other words, she says, for me to live is Christ. The die is game. You'll know that you know the Lord when you have the Lord. First John's very clear about it, chapter number five. First John five. It simply says this He that hath the Son hath life. I got an email yesterday from a person who said, Preacher, do you believe that you can be a born-again Christian and be a Roman Catholic? Well, I'll answer that email. Okay, I'll answer it. And here's the way I'll answer it. You can be a Christian and be a Baptist. You can be a Christian and be a Lutheran. You can be a Christian and be a Presbyterian or a Catholic or anything else. But I'm going to tell you something. Once you get serious with God, once the Holy Ghost begins to move in your soul and you really want you want communion and fellowship with the Lord. He will eliminate a lot of religions from your life. Amen. And you will find yourself seeking out those of like spirit. That means you're going to be leaving the Catholics and you're going to be leaving the dead Baptists and you're going to be leaving the Presbyterians. You're going to be leaving the whole religious crowd behind you. And you're going to find people who love the Lord, not love the law or themselves, but love the Lord. And that's the thing that unites us together. And we know it when we get in the presence of one who loves the Lord Jesus. We really do. We really do. And a person's self-righteousness will manifest itself. You can't hide it. You can't hide it. You get offended at preaching. Somebody gets up here and they begin to preach the word of God. And, and it begins to make you uncomfortable. It makes you uncomfortable because you're self-righteous. If your righteousness was the Lord Jesus Christ... You'd say, amen, oh me, but amen. <laughs> That's what you'd do. Yeah, you would. Amen, oh me, amen. <laughs> Glory to God. That's what you do. And if you truly know him and he knows you, you know he's your father and you know he's going to draw you closer to him. And you know that the chastisement is for your good. It's for your own good to bless you and fill you with the Holy Ghost where God can bless you. God wants to bless everybody, but he can't bless some of us. Because you can't handle the blessing. You're not ready for it. That's a fact of life. It's a tough thing. But some Christians cannot handle uh, anything other than self-condemnation and, and go around constantly moaning and groaning every day about how sorry and low down they are and how that, you know, they don't deserve this and don't deserve that and I'm not good enough for this and I'm not good enough for that. That is a righteousness of your own and you're parading it in front of everybody. He hath made us worthy by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross at Calvary. I receive his finished work, and that gives me a place at the table. Hallelujah. I don't deserve it, but he bought it. He bought it, and he paid for it. And he said to the disciples after his resurrection, he was cooking the meat and the, and the bread upon the fire. He said, come and dine. <laughs> come and dine. You remember that one? Come and dine. <laughs> come and dine, the master says. Come and dine. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to come and dine. Hallelujah. 
Satan will let you grovel in self-pity. He'll let you grovel in all. He will. He will. That's a tool. That's a weapon he uses on us. It's self-pity. And self-pity, I'm going to tell you this about what self-pity and all the rest of that, it's, it is essentially unbelief because you are refusing to accept the finished work of the Lord Jesus, what he did at the cross, to make you free. That's not condoning anything you do, but it's giving you light on the, on the, at the end of the tunnel. He's showing you don't have to live like this. There's something better for you. And God's made it for all of us. He doesn't want to deal with you as with a servant. He wants to deal with you as with a son. Amen. You're a servant because you choose to be a servant. God will call you a son. And when he calls you a son, he'll treat you like a son. And he'll say, here's your place, son, right here at the table. Move over, angel. <laughs> Here's a place from a son. <laughs> it's made us a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, he said in Hebrews chapter number 2. But we are sons of God by the new birth. He could save you and not call you a son. But he called us a son. He wants you to acknowledge him as your father. What a thing. When once you begin to burn it in your soul, he's my father. That's my father up there. Did you hear that devil? That's my father you're talking about. That's my father, Abba, father. And that's my savior. Amen. And the Holy Ghost will rejoice inside your soul once you begin to exalt the Son of God. Quit exalting yourself and quit preaching self-love and quit wallowing around in pity. Exalt the Son of God, not, our, not ourselves. Exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Ghost will have power in your life because when he comes, he'll not speak of himself. Amen. It's an odd thing. It's, it is. It's like, that, it's like that double nature. I know I'm not worthy. I know I'm not worthy to sit at his table, but I also know I'm his son. <laughs> I'm his son, and he can't be denied. Amen. Amen. Well, the Bible said in verse 13 of Romans 10, and this is a wonder, because this is a promise. This is not a formula. See, it's not a formula. I don't believe in formulas. You can go through Galatians and get saved. You can go through Matthew and get saved. You can go in th in through any book in the Bible and be saved. No, I don't believe in formulas. But it's a promise. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Red man, yellow man, black man, white man, rich man, poor man, bond man, free man, Russian, Italian, Greek, American, Portuguese, any man, for whosoever will, let him call upon the name of the Lord. Is that what it said? Well, just take the whosoever out of there and put your name in there. I've done that many times down here. I get down the altar with people, and I don't go to a specific thing. and do, I just get down there and try to feel something. <laughs> what do you mean? Sense the spirit going on. What's this person, what's the, what are they dealing with, you know? Try to find out, what, what do we need to do here? I don't pull out the, you know, the formula. I just get down there and I, I start praying with them and they'll let you know. But a lot of times I'll just take Romans 10, 13. I said, put your finger right there where it says, whosoever. I said, now, when you read that, put your name in there. And that seems to get a hold of a lot of people. It makes it very personal. And it is personal, isn't it? That's the word of God. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your holy word tonight. Bless your righteous name. I have no righteousness, so I don't have to defend any righteousness. I don't have to proclaim any righteousness. I don't have to work at any righteousness. My righteousness is the finished work of my Lord Jesus Christ. He did the job. It can't be made better. It can't be perfected. It was already perfect. Bless his holy name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.